Um, so coming into heating season, um, definitely need to be charging and testing in heat mode. Uh, we know that to get these houses up to temp, we need to run it in heat, realistically charge it in heat, um, and then you can do your testing and cooling uh, when taking screenshots of your measure quick. Uh, if your pressures look almost identical, you're in cooling mode, that's not going to really tell me much about what the system is functioning. Um, so let's get it in heat mode. Uh, I was talking to a couple guys. Do we know how to test in heat mode? Do we know how to hook up in heat mode? There was some hesitancy in the answers. So when we say wet bulb temperature, do you know what we're talking about? I want to, anybody care to answer that? Okay, so dry bulb temperature is what we normally measure with a thermometer, all right, because the end of your thermometer is dry. Wet bulb temperature is if you were to take a thermometer and you were to put a wet sock over it in an airstream, what would that temperature be? So basically, it's just factoring in evaporation. So when your wet bulb temperature and your dry bulb temperature are exactly the same, that means you're at 100% relative humidity because you have no evaporation. Okay, so I'm gonna restate that again so you understand what, what's being said here. If it's 100% relative humidity, you don't get any evaporation, wet bulb and dry bulb are the same. The more what they call wet bulb depression, the lower your wet bulb is in comparison to your dry bulb, the lower your relative humidity is. And so when you're doing, when you're using a chart that asks for, like this one does, it has a dry bulb and a wet bulb reference on this, uh, on the top of this chart. It says outdoor temperature, dry bulb slash wet bulb. That first number is dry bulb, the second number is wet bulb, there you go. Um, and so if you can take wet bulb, it's better to use the second number and reference the second number because that takes into account uh, what we call latent load or evaporative, okay? And now in heat mode, where is your evaporator? Outside. In heat mode, your evaporator is outside. That coil that used to be your condenser is now your evaporator. And so, therefore, humidity matters. The amount of moisture that that condenser collects is going to be uh, proportional to the relative humidity outside. Okay, so that's what that's all about. That's what I'm saying. Um, this is a little bit of an older chart. I haven't looked at one of these charts for, for like uh, infinity or like a newer piece of equipment um, in a long time. So I don't know that they look exactly like this, but there's going to be some sort of heat mode charging guideline that you're going to be able to find. Generally speaking, if it's, at, if it's lower than 65 degrees outside, that's when charging in heat mode is going to make more sense or checking in heat mode, generally speaking. Now, I want to pause quickly because there's a difference between checking the charge and charging. All right, how do we charge a system as an installer? What's the right way to charge a system? Nobody's speaking, so I'm getting worried. Go ahead. Cooling. Well, in cooling is the right way. To the suction sure. line port. To the suction line port is correct. But what's the primary method we use? Weighing. Weighing it in. There it is. Weighing it in, right? And that's going to be just as accurate as almost anything else you're going to do. Um, Subcooling in cooling mode is going to be the second most accurate way, but weighing it in is the most accurate way. Now, what's the problem with weighing it in? You guys all know. What's the what's the challenge with weighing it in? You can't see the line. Yeah, you, see the line. yeah you don't really know what the line what the line length is, right? Now, again, when you look at how much charge you're adding per foot, though, it's a very very small amount. Um, what is it? Uh, th uh, 0. 0.3. Uh, is, it, is that what it is? One point one ounce. Yeah. Like ounce. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a tiny. It's like a tenth of an ounce. Whatever it is. I'm not even remembering very well here. But it's a tiny, tiny amount of refrigerant per foot. And so you could even be five feet off, ten feet off, and have that make almost no difference in the system's operation. It's going to make almost no difference. So if you can estimate to within ten feet. Weighing it in is going to be your best bet. Now, those of you know that in a lot of cases you'll weigh it in and you might still be half a pound off. You might still be quarter of a pound off. You might still have to add a little bit to get the sub cool up. Right? You guys run into this a lot in cooling mode, right? Mm -hmm. But is that going to affect that operation of that equipment in, in any significant way? If it's, say, the whole time you haven't been able to set the charge or it's in the evening like today, so the evening, by the time you get the, get the charge set potentially, if it's a long install, it might be 50 degrees outside. 
you, you, you're going to want to do, you're going to want to go back and just double check when you're in cooling mode again. That's not a big deal. Okay, so does everybody, everybody understand that, agree with that? So weigh it in, check your heat mode based on what the manufacturer says. And again, we should probably do a separate class, which is just specifically on what Lennox is doing right now, what Carrie's doing right now. I, I really like the sort of review of installation guidelines. Um, but you guys can do that. You're all capable of doing that. Pull that thing out, look for, do that today on your install. Look for what the heating guidelines are in the installation instructions or on the back panel of the equipment. Um, and that is a check chart. That's not a charging chart. Big difference, right? It's the same reason why we still check superheat. Do we charge by superheat? No, we don't charge by superheat, but we still check it, right? Because checking it is another checkpoint. It tells us how the valve is working. You have a really super high superheat or a really low zero superheat, that tells you that your expansion valve probably isn't working right, right? So there's things that we're checking that aren't about charging. Two different things. Charging, weigh it in, and then double check stuff, cooling and cooling. Those are really the, that, that's the way you do it nowadays. You're checking your charge in heat mode though. Uh, there are some rules of thumb that you should know, and we'll go over those as well. We're going to be deploying um, some training, some LMS training, um, that I want you all to go through, uh, that we, Emily and I put together, or I helped her kind of just get, get some of the guidelines together. Um, that's gonna take you through some of those rules of thumb so that you can make sure that, you know, the equipment's working properly. But again, that's different than a system not being charged right. How often, again, go, go to, a, go to a, a typical change out, garage application, how much charge are you actually adding or removing from a typical residential garage change out? None or very little, right? There's not a whole lot of charge adjustment that's generally having to happen. It's when you know you know when you've got a 60, 70 foot line set, you've got a, a air handler on the second floor, that's when you know you're gonna have to take a little bit more time. You're gonna have to pay a little bit more attention. So again, if it's a garage unit, you go to a garage unit today, it's 50 degrees, you know the line set is right in that range. Do we really need to go back on that one? No, I mean, use your common sense. But if it's 40, 50, 60, 70 feet, and now you know, eh, did I really get this right? I'm not confident. That's when going back in cooling season, uh, just a quick 30 minute check. Uh, get that, just get it, on, get it on the calendar before you even leave. Just make sure it's on the calendar. Get with the CSRs, get it out there. Um, that's, not gonna, that's not gonna hurt anything. It's gonna be a good idea. But that doesn't mean you don't do all your checks while you're still there, right? You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying don't do what you're supposed to do now. It's just that make sure that you get it right uh, for next season. The thing I want to focus on more than anything else, though, is the idea of checking in heating, right? You have to check it in heating, and we need to do this even in cooling season. So that's things like making sure that your electric heat works, make sure it goes on, make sure it goes off. That's things like if you, if we don't install many gas furnaces anymore at all, do we? I mean, yeah, yeah, the the village <clears throat> yeah, sometimes in the middle. Yeah, the number one thing that drives me crazy is when we uh, get that first heating, it gets cold the first time and the gas valve is off or the switch on the gas valve is off. Because what does that prove? We didn't test it. Because we didn't test it. We didn't run it, right? That's not acceptable. You all, you all agree with that, right? I mean, like, it's, this isn't just a, a grouchy boss being grouchy. Like, you gotta test everything. If you put something in somebody's house, you've gotta make sure that it works. Next level is, yeah, I mean, should we be checking gas pressure? Yeah, we should, right? Should we be making sure, confirming airflow? Yeah, we should. Um, should we be doing a combustion analysis? Yeah, we should, which goes back to sort of my policy that I think we probably slipped away from. When we're doing gas furnace installations, we should be doing a commissioning. We should be doing, somebody should be checking airflow, should be confirming combustion, and should be testing gas pressure. Those are three things that we really need to be doing. And that falls in that category. I'm telling you guys, because if you get to the end of that gas furnace and you're like, hey, I haven't really been trained to do the, those three things, then we should get a call on schedule, have somebody go back, and that can be done right away. Um, somebody who knows how to do those three things. Um, it's just, it's, again, it's a safety thing. Um, another thing that I want you guys to be aware of, if you do a gas furnace, what else needs to be in the house? Uh, CO2. Low level CO2. Low level CO2 detector. The one we use is called Defender. Um, it's a battery powered thing, it's a piece of cake, just goes on the wall, it doesn't require any wiring, it's literally, there could not be any more simple. Um, that needs to be part of it. And if we forgot to sell it, then we need to make sure that we get one out there and get it on the wall before we leave, because that is our ultimate insurance. If a mistake is made, if there's recirculation, whatever, we're not gonna kill anybody. There's 
because you very much can. The problem with carbon monoxide is a lot of people get very sick and a lot of people die from it, and nobody ever knows. They just, like, oh, they had a heart attack, right? Like, you don't know, you don't smell it, you can't tell. And the ones that come in your house, the carbon monoxide detectors, they're terrible. They don't even start to alarm until you get to 100 ppm, which is well above dangerous levels. And a lot of times they don't work. And so it's just a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy thing. So for us, anytime we're working with gas appliances inside the house, if whether there's gas dryers, gas um, stoves, because a lot of times we'll pull a furnace out, but we're still leaving an existing gas water heater. The gas water heaters are, are absolutely um, infamous for, for making people sick because they're not even, they don't even have a deuce draft, right? If you ever paid attention to a gas water heater, it's just like a flame and it just goes up and it's got the, it's got the draft hood on it. So there's actually a gap. So if that thing starts to spill, like if a bird builds a nest in the flue or something, it'll just start spilling carbon monoxide in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's, it can be a real problem. Uh, so I want you guys to just, again, this is, goes back to what we were talking about a couple weeks ago. Be a professional. Um, catch those things. Pay attention to those things. Uh, who here gets frustrated with Tyler sometimes when he misses details? Go ahead and raise your hand. This is true of all salesmen. This isn't picking on Tyler. You get... Anytime you're selling, you do miss things sometimes. I guarantee you that if you guys were selling, you would miss something on almost every job. When I did it, I did too. It's easy to criticize somebody uh, for what they miss, but we all miss things sometimes. Like, ah, oh, man, I should have noticed that. I should have caught that. It's easy to criticize someone else, uh, but what I want to encourage us all to do is just keep raising the bar for ourselves and for each other too, reminding, hey, you could have caught that. Here's how you could have noticed that. Here's how you could have found this out because we want the jobs to go really well, but ultimately you guys are the last line of defense before when you leave that customer's house and you collect money, they expect it to work, they expect it to be safe, they expect it to be efficient. And so if there are any question marks, if there's anything that has to be addressed, then we need to make sure we get that on schedule. If there's anything that there's an opportunity for the client to be unsafe, we need to stop and make sure that that's addressed. One of the best examples that I, that I saw when I was attacked of, of this kind of craziness Somebody put, this was another company, they put a, uh, a heat pump in place of a gas furnace. I, I probably told you all this story before, but it's just an important one. They put a heat pump in place of a gas furnace, and what they did was they just took the, the gas valve and they just shut it off, okay, and they unhooked it. Well, this was a vacation home, and so now you have this valve, this cool looking valve, pretty shiny brass valve, wide open with a, with a t red T handle. You know what's gonna happen? given enough time. Some kid is going to be like, what's this? Right? That runs for a little bit and it will blow a house up. I mean, that's what, I don't know if you saw on news, those guys, literally HVAC guys got killed in a house, completely exploded a house. Um, gas is just something you do not want to play around with. You, we have to make sure. So what? So what's the right thing to do there? What's the right thing to do before you leave? Cap it. Cap it right? Cap it. Make sure it's completely capped. Same thing is true like when you are demoing a, um, uh, a flu and it's tied in with the water <clears throat> right like you can't just leave it you can't just unhook it and then just like leave it open like you have to you have to redo it it has to be done correctly it has to be sized correctly uh, those are all things that uh, that we have to be kind of we have in our mind think about notice you walk into a garage and you see that water heater and you can see the top of the water heater is all scorched looking um, stop that's not necessarily what we're even working on, but that client, that thing's been backdrafting. That thing's probably spilling carbon monoxide and, and products of combustion into the garage. You've all seen it and you just haven't noticed it. You're like, oh, well, you know, whatever, we move on. Like, stop, there's a problem. It's an opportunity for us to help a client be safe. So you get what I'm saying, right? We can all get frustrated with the sales guy. We can all get frustrated with leadership. We can all get frustrated, that's natural, right? We're all gonna get a little grumpy sometimes, that's fine. But as much as it depends on us, we need to keep raising the bar um, to when we see these things to actually address it and deal with it. And at the end of it, you have tested everything to the best of your ability. That equipment's going to work uh, for the life expectancy of that product for the client. Because in a lot of cases, these issues aren't necessarily your fault. It's just existing conditions. Like there's things you end up in and it's like, oh man, this is how it already was, right? You take a, the example I always use is a condenser that's sitting right in front of a dryer vent. We can put it right back there again and leave that problem uh, for the next 10 years to deal with. Or we can say, hey, is there, can we move this over three feet? Is there a, is there a way we can adjust this? 
think about condenser orientation, how it's pointed. Just because it was the one way doesn't mean it has to stay that way. We can change it to make it more accessible. If it's got bushes that are completely you know, containing the thing and you know it's going to be a problem for the equipment, now's the time to bring it up to the client. Hey, do you think, because this really isn't great for your air conditioner. It's also not great for us, but it's not great for your air conditioner to have the bushes right here. Do you think you could get the landscaper to, to get these things you know, moved out a little ways? Um, that's a good conversation to have. Now again, there's a way to do it that's rude and aggressive, or there's a way to do it that's about them and their needs, right? And that's just knowing how to talk to people. Um, and then you document it, right? Noted to the client that the bushes should probably be moved, right? That kind of thing. So does that make sense? Does that make sense kind of what I'm encouraging here? Um, there's a, I, I wanted to ask this question of you guys this morning. Um, how long should an install take? There's the answer. That's the answer, as long as it needs to take. When we get into the mindset, we get used to a standard install ending at three, right? Because we're just really good at our jobs. <clears throat> That's great. It's good to be efficient. It's good to get into that flow state, to get really good at knocking a job out, but not at the expense of just blowing by a problem um, because we just want to get out of there. Because again, you know how it is. When you roll up to a job and you were already you already had plans, right? You already you already know when this job is gonna end, and so you've already man, you've made plans with your friends or with your family or whatever, and now a problem comes up, it makes it easier to not pause and deal with that problem. We've all done it. And so what I'm asking you to do is get into the mindset of an install takes as long as it needs to take. Now sometimes that means that it needs to take more than one day. So I'm not saying that that means you should be working until two in the morning or something. You know, I'm not, I'm, I've done it plenty, so I'm not, you know, sometimes it does need that just because you ran into an issue and you gotta get a customer up. But especially in this season, you know, if a job needs to take two days in order to do it properly, well then that's what it needs to take. And I've been talking a lot with uh, the team about trying to do more duct work and things in this season that are a little bit more time consuming and are a little bit more thorough, because now's the time to do it. Attics aren't that bad right now, right? And for the next couple months, that's gonna be how it is. So especially in this season, use this season as an opportunity to not rush. You don't need to be in a hurry. Level up your game, get used to using your tools, read that installation manual. Uh, today, when you go out, don't try to just knock the job out. Try to learn something new. Try to up your game. Try to you know try a new practice that might be a little better and that you can share. That's now's the time to do that, um, rather than continuing to just forge ahead and get frustrated because oh this job's not going as fast as I thought it should. Oh my gosh, it's not. Why is it? Why is it like this? Why is the planning so bad? It's like, look, the only way to change things is to take the time to change it. And so if there's a process problem and with how we're doing insults, now is the time. Now's the time to change it. If there's something new we want to learn, now's the time to learn it. And I'm encouraging everybody in that. Service techs, Tyler, you guys, leadership, challenging everybody. Let's get curious. Let's, let's actually figure things out in this season so that that way when we get into next summer, we've leveled up. We've gotten that much better at what we do. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.